Welcome to the Rise of AI virtual chat series. My name is Fabian Westerheide. I'm an entrepreneur and investor with a passion for artificial intelligence. And in this episode, we have two guests. We have Adrian Locher and Rasmus Rotem, both are the founders and the chairmen and board of directors of the company Merantix. Merantix is one of the first true venture studio mainly focused only in AI. So to make it short, they are building regular venture capital cases or artificial intelligence companies. And we will have today a lively discussion about what are business models for AI, what are trends, how to make money with AI, how to start and other learnings, everything around business development and artificial intelligence. So it's, it's, it was a one hour live show. You can log online to see the chat and connect with the people. Else, just enjoy and watch it. See you again. Welcome. Um, good afternoon, good morning. Good evening to everyone in the world. It is great to be back live again. I'm saying hello to everyone. Um, last time we had visitors from Brazil to New Zealand, Singapore, all over the world. So as usual, tell us who you are, share your LinkedIn profile, tell us where you're from, where you're based. I mean, we do this um, for two reasons. We want to be entertained, we want to learn something and we want to connect, we want to meet new people. Probably everyone is still stuck at home or in an office. I record everything from my office. Oh no, the office, it's my it's my home. From home, you are sitting at home or in the office. So we are here, we connect, we speak with each other, and it's live. Um so today, um, as I said, post your LinkedIn profile. This is a tradition we normally do. Um, our topic today is uh second. So, concentration, Fabian. Um, before we start into the topic today, I would like to point out that we have a new webinar series. So, it's called uh, the Rise of AI, AI Academy. And we are offering three courses over the period from three weeks. Each course, six hours. So, it's intensive workout, including, you know, quizzes, tests. Uh, you get a certification. Veronica is doing it. She will say hello. I already said hello in the chat, too. She's organizing together with a tech agency we're doing it for a while who really know how to, you know, the technical stuff. A, it's AI for managers. So if you have a first idea what AI is and you would like to know what tools are out there, um, what is AI, what is, um, you know, neural nets and different machine learning methods, go in. Learn it so you get a first introduction. Then we have one explainable AI. This is similar to the topic we had with Beryl Simacek last week in our virtual chat where we spoke about trustworthy AI. So there you learn the tools to understand if your AI is doing the right decisions, which is perfect for reports, due diligence, ethical discussions for your board of advisors. You know, if you want to, if you have an AI, an AI your company, you need to explain what it's doing take this course. And then with a third course, it's data scientists for beginners. And two things I would like to add. First, if you're interested, go on um, our website slash academy or just click on the menu. Um, second, we offer it for 99 euros per course. You know, we don't do it for free because there are teachers in the background. There's a lot of preparation. You get a full education and it's a course. For us, it's a test, you know, uh, what other topics you would like to, and we build and we know we could have 40 courses on top over a whole period. And um, instead of normally 300 euro per day. So it's 99 euros instead of 300. And second, I will take part myself too, because especially the first topic, AI for managers, I want to refresh my knowledge. I want to see what's new out there. See, I have a business degree and even I work a lot of AI. I think there's something for me. So if I will do it, maybe you want to do it too. And Veronica has already uh, shared the link. Um, our guests today are Rasmus and Adrian, and they are already in the, in the back, in the, in the green room, and they will come live soon. So our topic today is Everything around, I call it how to make money with AI. So AI business models, AI trends, everything, you know, combining, making money, making revenue, reducing costs with AI. And who's really good speaking about this are our guests today. Um, I know when I met Adrian the first time, he was doing a sabbatical. So he just had sold one of his many companies he had started, had the liquidity, took a sabbatical, he traveled, 
And then he got kind of bored during the traveling. And then we met in Berlin because he wanted to do something new into AI. And I was one of the people he contacted in Berlin and said, hey, I like Berlin. I like AI. Let's talk. And we talked. And then similar time, I met Rasmus on a meetup where he talked about how he used deep learning, I think, to mask in a lot of faces for dating algorithms and something like hot or not uh, just with AI, which was, let's say, giving him a lot of buzz at this time. And shortly after this, they both started Merantix. And we will talk about what Merantix is doing a little bit later. Um, so when I met them, both were, you know, one from the research side doing AI, the other one from the business side not doing a lot of AI, and they had not really an idea where they will be five years or four years later, four years. Um, so here we have Erasmus. And I asked them for children pictures before, and they shared them with me. So um, Rasmus is, a, by education, an engineer. He's in, uh, he studied information engineering in Oxford and Princeton, which are some really good universities. And then he did his PhD in ETH Zürich, which is another really good university. So just on the paper, technical, he has the best education in this space. Uh, he has like 15 publications. He was quoted a couple of thousand times. He's founder of Hack Zürich when he was still in Zurich. And then he came to Berlin and he co-founded um, Merantix with, uh, with Adrian. So Rasmus is more on the technical side on the AI. He is Forbes 30 under 30. He was in the Studienstiftung and which I like personally a lot. He's founding member and board of directors of the German Association for AI, which is a really cool thing, which was initiated by both of them to say, hey, we need a lobbying group for German AI groups, and they think within a couple of years, two years, they had over 200 members already in the association. And then on the other side, the other one, you know, Handcraft Kit, um, there we have Adrian Locher. And Adrian Locher is more the business side. He studied in St. Gallen. He uh, attended Singularity University. He's a member of Entrepreneurs Organization. Um, you know, this is how you describe a really well-educated business person. He has started, and this is his own description, 10 companies of four with four exits means he has failed before or still keeping the companies. Very valid if someone, I like it, saying, hey, only 40% of them I sold, which is a fair and honestly a good one. The biggest exit there was over $60 million. I assume it was Dine Deal, but he never told me. So he was involved in some good exits. He's an angel investor as usual. And I also like when I you know, did my research, he sells somewhere in his files, he reported to Mark Zuckerberg because in very early, I think 2007, he was working for, face, for Facebook. So he's in the field for a while. And um, today, and I'm sorry, it's not the best picture. Um, today, they are the founders and majority owners of Merantix. And Merantix is in self-description, a venture studio. So I describe it as a company builder slash accelerating elements plus early stage fund. You can read it in the news. They have raised 25 million euros just for their own companies. They have a 25 million fund. They are launching, let's say, two to four companies a year. They already have launched a couple of AI-driven companies, and now even they have the money to fund this. Um, what they do, and they will describe this. Wonderful. Uh... That's why I love technology, right? <laughs> so back, um, they do the sourcing, the evaluation, the funding, the incubation. So if you're an entrepreneur out there or you would like to start a business or you're a smart person, this is the perfect entry. Um, if you're just a typical startup and having already funding, this is not the typical VC approach. This is the one, if you're an entrepreneur, you want to do something. They provide you with data, with research, with regulation, bring in the talent, the funding. And that's why it makes a lot of sense to have a company builder or a venture studio for this. Because in AI, and we talk about this now, you need more than if you do e-commerce or something like this. But having this said, now let me bring them online. Um, Hi, everyone. You, you, you don't smile, so my introduction was uh, <laughs> not correct all the time. No, it was awesome. Thanks a lot. It was very flattering. <laughs> Good. So, um, as usual for everyone out there, you can use the ask the question function. Um, I see the questions then, I will go through them and then pick 
one, I will ask both of them. You can address them to both of them, or you can address them just to Adrian. Adrian, wave your hand for a second. Yes, and Rasmus, your hand. Uh -huh. So you know, know the screen where they're sitting. Um, we're talking today about AI and making money with it. What is the business model of a venture studio? Well, our business is building companies and investing in them. And so in, in essence, the business model is around creating companies and over the course of time, of course, also um, going to exit them. Um, even that's something we um, believe is going to take quite some time, which is part of our um, core beliefs, why we have set up uh, the Venture Studio in the way we did with a with a fund that has over 10 years of, of runtime. Um, we believe that, you know, AI is still in its very infancy, even though people talk about uh, it a lot, um, where you still believe that the biggest impact will be seen more like in the next five to 10 years to come. And... Um... Rasmus, you only earn money when you sell the company. I mean, that don't doesn't your portfolio companies try to earn some money as well? And if we lost Rasmus no, now, Adrian, you have to answer. <laughs> no, no, for sure. I mean, like obviously, I think that's also something I think we will talk a lot about today. Is um, all these companies have solid business models and are, are generating revenue? But I think from from an investor perspective, so we have we raised this, this 25 million euro fund where we have some investors behind it. And from them, it's very much a 10, 15 year horizon uh, where they don't care that much about um, the revenue next year or the year after, but they care about can this company be truly impactful in the next 10, 15 years and um, have a big impact and thereby also have a generate significant revenues. And so um, I think we're very fortunate to have these investors on board who also think very long term about this because um, for some of the topics we go into, they are in quite complex regulated markets, technology is hard. Um, and so it's very different maybe from the last decade or so, uh, where a lot of them were maybe like, you know, putting an app in the app store is something where you get feedback very quickly. There's little regulation within a month or two, um, you see people using it and you can iterate and pivot. But for like, if you bring a medical product to the market, that's not something you pull off in, in a month that might take a year or two. And so the horizons are just much longer. And so we, we also try to get investors behind it to kind of that perspective. So for my entrepreneur and VC experience, I think this is a highly interested model. Um, first, if you invest in an AI company, it takes up to two years to build a product market fit to go live and you need patient investors because you can't roll traction. So you, Marantix, uh, you help them over the first two years, make them ready before external investors are coming in. So it's really like having them in a, you know, closed environment and pepping them. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a very interesting uh, description. I think our model is all about validation. Um, validation, not only in terms of business models, but also in terms of the technology. And of course, also the single most important factor of early stage, which is the team. Um, and only after these three factors have been properly validated, we believe a company is ready to, you know, go out and graduate from, from the venture studio and, and um, you know, raise external, external money in the, in the Series A. So our model uh, we have is very much focused on providing seed and pre-seed um, but besides that, and, and, and we believe that is really important here, um, money is not the only thing we're investing, nor do we believe it's the most important one at this stage of company building in deep tech. So this whole environment of synergies and the ecosystem that we created, which is all about, you know, um, technology platform that is shared, uh, but even more so um, business best practices, technology best practices, uh, but also access to industry for first POC, for first validation to win customers and partners. 
um, is truly, truly essential. And um, so in, in our eyes, these are, you know, synergies that are acting as compounding factors in building companies. And the more companies we build, um, the more value is actually created on the platform that each new company that we create together with our founders are able to tap in. I would disagree there. Having built a company builder before that the synergies are at the end less than you think, but still there are synergies and it makes a lot of sense. And I agree on the research learnings, on the technical part, on the fund, funding operations. I mean, let the founders focus on building a product and selling it. How, by the way, founders, I mean, you are the founders of Merantix. Now you have ventures below. How do you screen them? How do you get them? Like, And what kind of people do you look for? Maybe, maybe, um, uh, and, and of course, Rasmus, you just jump in, but but maybe discuss, let's discuss, let's quickly discuss your disagreement because I think it's really important. Okay. Um, and and I also know where it comes from. Um, and 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 that's why I would like to explain um, why um, I, I think uh, we're not talking about the same things. Um, because usually when you talk about company builders, um, the synergies you talk about are shared engineering resources, marketing, sales. Um, so it's, it's a lot about shared people that help building companies. And while we believe that this is a, an interesting model for companies that are very much execution-based, um, it is absolutely not, in our eyes at least, for deep tech companies that are very much technology driven in the beginning, but then also business model driven. So we are not believers in creating synergies by sharing resources, which is mostly FTE in the in the in sure. the company builder cases. But our synergies are much more intangible in a way because it's much more around you know this common technology stack that you build, but then have engineering teams that are dedicated in the companies and they only work for this one company um, working on. And then also um, having people share their knowledge and expertise among the companies um, in, a, in, a, in a rather informal way. So it's not uh, that we try to enforce things here, but they start to happen naturally. And, you know, when you're in a, in a research heavy field, such as machine learning, AI, um, you know, like developments are, are, are going on like um, very, very fast. And there are new um, uh, breakthroughs every uh, Adrian, you have muted yourself maybe. So, until we have Adrian back, Rasmus. Uh, yeah, um, I can continue. Um, I, I understand the discussion, but let's jump in for a second about the founders. Like, what kind of people do you look for? Because you can't start the business yourself. Yeah, sure. And I think that's that's honestly the, the most important part of our model and probably is also going to be the biggest factor um, for which will decide whether we will be successful or not to, to pick these entrepreneurs um, to build the companies with us. And in general, um i think like there's 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 everything you look in general for in an entrepreneur and i think there are a few things which are specifically important for ai and so maybe i'll just focus on those um i think like the timelines are very long the problems and so you need to be very persistent and basically be fine with an environment where feedback and you know success might take five to ten years and you you not necessarily can flip something very quickly so you're definitely looking for people who are great leaders and charismatic and you know have the right knowledge but also we have this persistent to go after these like harder kind of cases i think the other one is also to have a um a certain depth of understanding of AI, even if you are the ceo so um usually our founders we have a ceo and a cto and the cto is obviously super technical and has a very deep background in machine learning um, but also has um you know as has, has a skill to lead teams um, but even in the ceo who would be responsible more for the business side we look for people who have uh, at least a basic understanding of AI, but then also just kind of the intellectual capacity to 
drive into really complex issues because even they might have to deal with regulatory issues or they might have to, I don't know, sell to car companies where on the other side, automotive companies where on the other side, super technical people sit next to you and you. So they also need to be able to discuss with them on the same level. And also when you raise follow up rounds, Series A, Series B, the investors uh, will dive very deeply into what you do. And so you always you also need kind of that level of expertise there. And we've been looking, I mean, we've, we constantly talk to entrepreneurs and residents. We have We've currently three new entrepreneurs and residents we work with um, to to you basically end up with those three. We talk to over 300 people, so um, it is quite a it's quite an evolved process, and we are I mean constantly looking for 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 new entrepreneurs and residents to join us. But um, the bar is very high, and like it's in the end, I mean like a lot of interviews, but also what's really important for us is to get to know the, the person better and work with them. And so for that, we actually design um, two days. We, uh, do, do, do a two-day on-site challenge where we basically work with them together on a potentially new venture case and have them also interact with a lot of people to really see also is there a culture of it is this a person i would want to work with for the next five to ten years because i think that's that's the rises we need to look at also okay. for this so it's not just being hired for a job arlene just back in i am back in sorry Wonderful. For that. good uh, that's if you have two partners that's perfect Question for the founders: What is like the the the, the age? Are they like twenty five right from university, or like forty five doing the third career? I think it's a mix. So some some are relatively fresh off university. Some have um, right now four or five years of work experience. Have started a company before, or have been in a in a job. So um, it's a mix. I think we we don't discriminate on age. Um, we've been also talking to people who are um, much older. I think that's also super interesting. In the end, it's there needs to be something with that vows us about that person. And um, so far, yeah, I mean, the, the next ERs are all like in their um, early 30s. Um, so I have a few years of experience. Okay. Um, I flip from each two of you, depending on the quality of the stream today. Yes. Yeah, so, Adrian, tell me, where can you make money currently with AI? Oh, like where does I, it where does it internal like two things where as a startup does it make sense to go in where you say that's a good market an opportunity and what do you say as enterprises who really exist where should they start in AI like internal yeah I think there's a, there's this one interesting um, distinction that we need to make um, and you also brought it up already I think Ras has mentioned that we were doing a lot of research in the beginning of, of the company creation, um, we realized that there are many, many hundreds of interesting machine learning AI cases. Yes. Only a few of them will be valid and interesting venture models. So you um, mean depending to start a company just yes. for solving this problem? Yes. Yes. Um, so the majority of, 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 of opportunities we have come across, uh, we realize that this is things actually um, the existing industry incumbents would be best at, you know, implementing some machine learning AI knowledge and then actually solve it, applying technology rather than, you know, you try to build a venture around just because the the value add you're creating is too incremental to make for a good venture case, right? Mm -hmm. If 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 you're looking at good at good venture cases, it's it's basically um, you need to have an idea and a, and an actual path to a let's say billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. um, if not, it's not a good venture case, right? Um, and so I think this is the first. And most important distinction that you need to make when you look at when you look at at cases, um, and and also this is the reason why we have not only come up with you know building ventures, but we also have our own let's say service firm, which is one of our portfolio companies, which is actually helping you know corporates, uh, large companies, but also Mittelstand uh, to actually build machine learning solutions that then can be applied inside companies so Think. one of your ventures is providing knowledge and you know i know you do workshops and education too so you help clients to digitize and use ai 
and then you also build companies which sell solutions to them so from your because you are very into the market you look at hundreds of ideas a year what are like the top three opportunities currently we all know it's ideas nothing is all about the execution but where do you see like currently a gap a strategic gap um i mean i, I can i can start i think I think one space we are super excited about is biology at the intersection of machine learning. Um, that is, um, there is a lot of data in bio biology, and there will be more and more in the next couple of years as sequencing costs are going down for DNA sequencing. And so we'll just have so much more data, which right now has been not really there or very manually analyzed. And so I think there are a lot of applications for this, both for I don't know optimizing proteins and then looking towards farmer application, but also potentially high value chemicals. So I think this is just like a f whole field, which is just opening up and there are already companies out there, but in the next 10 years, we will see a lot of new exciting companies there. That's one field. I think another one, um, which is more from a technological angle, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot in computer vision. I think, I wouldn't say computer vision is solved, but like for standard image classification or object detection, assuming we have enough training data, we can build pretty good systems analyzing these images. And so there have been a lot of companies in the last couple of years solving that for specific vertical use cases. Um, there's also a lot of tools out there which make it very easy for um, companies to build their own solutions there. So I think that's where already has a lot of happened. I think for the next couple of years, we still see similar um, stuff happening. And we are already seeing that in the space of like language understanding, natural language understanding, natural language processing, where we've also made a couple of years later after computer vision kind of made similar progress, like the image net moment, the moment when on this famous computer vision challenge, suddenly the deep learning was really strong. We're, we're seeing a similar moment in, in, in language now, and that will open up a lot of interesting applications, which are around processing large amounts of documents automatically. I mean, all the, the customer service automation, I think there's still a lot, there will more happen. There's the whole layer of voice. So whether it's around translation, whether it's about generating synthetic voice, whether it's about dubbing stuff, um, but also in the, in, the, in the context of creating content. So maybe having um, algorithms create reports, which currently humans write based on data or, um, you know, maybe in education. So I think there are a lot of, or marketing. So I think there will just be a lot of applications which are just now opening up because the technology suddenly or slowly gets to a point where, where it gets interesting for commercial use. And so that's, okay. that's another area we are super so excited about. It's natural language processing, communication, everything written or, you know, speaking. And I can agree. By the way, for founders out there, this is the most mature field. There are a lot of companies out there trying to solve this, but no one really is huge. Then we have image recognition, which is more a technology and a concept, but makes a lot of sense because we humans do a lot with our eyes. And replacing human senses with a machine if you have abundance of data, it's a very smart move, and I agree there too. Software is pretty well, so now we we're looking for some interesting business models. And the next one you said is biology, which is not yet there, which is an upcoming opportunity, which makes sense to maybe go into. If you have, I would recommend the market knowledge and access to the resources because you need to get the data, you need to build the models. And by the way, will be different talk, but building AI companies is expensive. Um, now, Adrian, another three opportunities from you. Share something <laughs> from your insights. Well, you know, it depends. It really depends on whether you're trying to monetize things very quickly um, or whether you're willing to invest and then later um, profit from what you've built. So, you know, I think one one um area that we are where we are excited about but we you know very little and and therefore we have not started to explore it yet but we know that machine learning will play a big role is quantum physics right um so that's a big big thing to solve yes <laughs> that is that is going to be huge um another one where i personally also am a big believer of is is the 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 field of neuroscience um, I personally see machine learning as a, as a fantastic tool to actually understand the, the human brain better, which is still in its very infancy when you, when you look mm -hmm. at, at our common understanding of this topic. So I think there is going to be massive breakthroughs in the next couple of years, might also be 10 years. So it's really hard to say. Um, 
And then on the other hand, you know, like, um, of course, you can you can go into um, automation cases that are more obvious where you are going to create faster revenue. So, you know, talking about, I don't know, e-commerce applications where um, you are going to automate um, human work um, that is done today at large scale um, with machines will also um, enable you to create interesting business models, right? So um, I think if, if, if you talk about <laughs> the ways we see AI enabling business models, uh, you could say we have two layers of looking at things. One layer is the one that is talked about a lot, which is automation. Mm -hmm. um, so complex decision-making processes where human experts are involved and necessary, and they're getting better and better the more experience they have. Um, that's a very interesting case in general because you can definitely train the machine with much more data than any human expert in the world can be trained. Um, so it's self-speaking pretty obvious that in those cases, um, machines will be better um, at okay. some point than uh, most human experts. Um, For example, like answering emails and customer support. Like the easy example. one, where's my package, yeah. etc. This can be For 24 example. hours quick going. Yes, yes. Um, and the other layer that is is much less often talked about, um, but but as important and, uh, as we see it, is accuracy. Um, you know, um, it's not only about automation, okay. but it's also about how many mistakes are done in certain processes where human decision making is involved um, because um, if a machine is trained well um, it's also pretty self-explanatory that it will make less mistakes than a human because the machine has no conditions um, that humans usually are affected by that's interesting argument last week we had uh, the topic explainable ai and trustworthy ai and there we learned it's a trade-off between accuracy and explainability and i assume regulation will lead to that you maybe have less accuracy because you need to open you know give the frameworks provide the data you need to have less quality but therefore you can do the reasoning by the way i know that you rasmus are having just published in the newspapers something about this um that we need to discuss this and this is coming to. Um, I like your answer in the way that Rasmus was giving us really now existing cases and you gave us the CEO like visionary cases for the next five to 10 years. And by the way, neuroscience is great. I recommend checking out from Elon Musk Neuralink the public demo they did and how they were analyzing brain patterns and signals. And then once you have the data, it's about machine learning to figure out what is a person thinking in the moment and how can I put this into code and back. Um, you're talking a lot with enterprises. What is like your, I mean, on, AI is not easy to sell currently. It takes long, it takes very long to do, to, to do pilots, to get the data and train the systems. What do you think is the largest bottleneck in interacting with enterprises to make sales, to convince them to, to to use AI to either build it or buy it? That's a great question. Um, I think when we look at the last maybe two, three years, it has become easier, I would say, um, due to the fact that people have understood the concept of machine learning AI much better Mm -hmm. So their expectations in this technology, how it can be applied, is more realistic. Um, and they also are willing to take some risks um, in order to get there. Because, you know, when, you, when we are selling a POC project to a large corporate, um, that means we're not selling a waterfall project that delivers a certain product, but we are actually selling a research project. 
with a lot of uncertainty where we don't exactly know what's going to be the outcome. That's why we call it POC, because we first need to figure out whether it's technologically feasible, you know, the business, business model application makes sense, and so on and so forth. And only after digging in there, um, we will be able to have a much better, more educated perspective on how impactful can a solution that is built on top of this POC then actually be. And, and, and only there we are going to be able to make better predictions how, you know, what, what level of, de what, what degree of automation we're able to achieve, how um, uh, will the accuracy uh, be. Um, this is stuff that you generally don't know when you start the journey. And that's, of course, what makes it a bit more difficult than, you know, trying to sell, I don't know, a website where you know what's going to be the result. So to everyone out there, POC, I think, means proof of concept. Uh, yeah, sorry. Similar like if you do hardware proof of design and proof of prototype, a proof of market product fit, etc. But usual you pitch to a client, they either they come to you because of the problem or you contact them and tell them, I, I know your problems, I can solve this, maybe. And then you get 20, 50, 100,000 euros, if you're good, to test this, to roll it out, maybe to develop a product with them as a prototype and then knowing if you can scale or not. And that makes, by the way, a sales pipeline within my portfolio up to two years until you have a long, like monthly recurring revenue contract. So do you do, you do like selling applied research? I think, yeah, I think we have like, you could bucket in like three things. So like for some companies where it's still very unclear, where AI has can has uh, can have the biggest potential, and they might want to find out, or where we still need to evaluate a lot if data is available and um, what use case to really focus on. First, we sometimes firstly start with workshops, so where we just spend a couple of days with the companies, uh, really diving really deeply. So it's not it's on a very technical level, really looking at data already and seeing okay, is this actually possible. And that's that's the first stage, and then the second stage is um, doing this proof of concept we just talked about. So running small projects with them where there's still a lot of technological risk. And then the third stage is um, building production ready systems. And um, we could basically enter with companies at all stages, right? So if um, if the company is still on a very high level and it's just like, hey, we need to do something with AI, we we'll, can start with workshops. Some already have a specific problem they want to solve. And then it's about uh, proof of concept and sometimes even it's already no, known that it's basically possible what they want to do. And then it's directly going into a production ready system. But usually then we grow, get from one stage to the next one, basically, as we mature. And I think we can see in the last couple of years that companies have a much clearer expectation of what they want. So I think three years ago, 80% of the companies were really let's do something with AI. And now 80% of the companies already have some concrete, at least application in mind. And then it's our job to evaluate, is this possible? And then build the system for that. But that sounds a lot like a project agency, but I know that you have portfolio companies, so they are having products they sell, or? Yeah. So they so already have we, we, they yeah, have time. Just, yeah, exactly. We just talked about the Marantix Labs, you know, solutions provider um, company. Um, besides that, we have right now two other product companies, Vara, which is a, a medical imaging platform, which helps mm -hmm. as doctors in the, in the in this case of breast cancer uh, detection and breast cancer screening. Uh, to make less mistakes but also to work more efficiently and so that's a medically ce certified medical product in the market um basically a workflow solution helping helping doctors and that's that's a product we we are actively selling right now uh, across europe and um that's one company vara the healthcare company and then mm -hmm. there's zia search which is um a company in the space of automated driving it's a data platform for for sensor data from cars with sensors so if you have an automated car, whether it's a highway pilot or some crazy level four or five, so like a fully autonomous car, um, they have a ton of sensors that produce a lot of data. So camera data, but also LIDAR, so distance measurements. And that's petabytes of data. And so you can imagine when you have a few of these cars in the street, you basically drown in data in petabytes, hundreds of petabytes. And so our data platform basically helps to analyze all this data and makes, makes it searchable. So you can say, hey, give me all the data where pedestrian that xyz and then it will filter that and or it can also tell me what data to keep and maybe throw away because you have so much data from empty highways that 
you know, you don't need to store it all because it's going to cost you like millions per year. And so we basically sell this solution, um, this product to anyone uh, who has large amounts of uh, sensor data from, from cars. Okay. So we have the first question by Tasso to this. And he asked, how long will it take until an AI solution will be accepted as a commodity? For I, I, it's an interesting question. I would translate it a little bit like, when will it not be AI anymore, but just software? Um, I, I think that very much depends on the space and the, yeah, the, solu the, the topics, right? I mean, there is a lot of things that have become commodity already and you can like, like money laundry detection you know credit card fraud and something like this yeah the, the, there you have a lot of, of existing um solutions that you can almost buy out of the box right mm -hmm. and i think this is also what what's so interesting about about a technology like ai um you know even though today a lot of what we do is is pretty is pretty I would say close to rocket science and is, is a lot of research and development. Um, we are not under the um, era of, of assumption that um, this won't be a commodity in 10 years from now, um, mm -hmm. as it happens with all technologies, right? Um, all technologies start being very exclusive. You only have a little uh, group of people who really gets it and, and can actually apply it. And then as things evolve, more and more solutions come out, more and more um, is commoditized. And then at the end, it's not so much about technology anymore, but about how it's actually applied to enable um, business cases, right? And this is also the way we look at, at, at AI as a, as a general purpose technology that in our eyes is going to be the most important of, of, of the 21st century. Um, but it will be no different than, for example, the internet before um, that has commoditized a lot. And um, today um, you won't find a lot of companies selling internet technologies, but you will find a lot of companies selling business models that are enabled by internet technologies. So they say it's either X plus AI, yes. Um, so you just take anything and combine it with AI. Or you take business model and infuse it by AI. Like you know, you're an automotive company. You can use self-driving cars to build a new business model around this. Um, my personal view is AI is a commodity when it's free, like the internet or websites, like typical where it's just accessible with WordPress and other theme. but I think WordPress is like driving up to one third of all the net internet pages out there and it's free. So everyone can build its own website. I think AI is finally there when everyone can apply, build, customize their own AI, even an enterprise. Yes, drag and drop like in, in a sexy SAP or do it at home, like installing in an app and you have an AI managing something for you. And um, I agree, this will come market by market, but we will have this. So, for my view, or in other questions, what is currently, I mean, we all know that AI is growing. You, you do more business, I do more business, this is a growth. Still, it's not perfect. There are still a lot of obstacles out there. We know that Chinese are very fast regarding funding and data and mm -hmm. regulation. The Americans have with Silicon Valley and Head Start. You know, we in Europe are behind. Um, what do you think, what do you need? What could change out there which would make your life a little bit easier? Are you referring are you referring to, to Europe? Like what we need to yeah, do in Europe in order to not lose enterprises, economy, uh, politics, society. I mean, what are the factors currently? And we all have bottlenecks. What is currently your limitation for more growth or more success and then overall in the AI market? So let me start with the with the overall narrative, and then I'll have Rasmus go into into details. Um, you know, that's not always I think, works. <laughs> I think I think um, a, a fast answer to your question would be: We need to change the narrative how we think and approach new technologies in in Europe. Um, 
because approaching it in a way of thinking of regulation first before exploring is just not going to work. Um, you know, the belief that you can minimize mistakes and failures by putting a lot of regulation up front, in my eyes, is just never worked. It never has never worked. worked. Has never worked. And this is seriously, this is seriously, of course, um, posing posing threats to uh, you know the European ecosystem. Let's let's put it that way: the European deep tech ecosystem. Um, if we're always attacking things from this angle first, um, and at the same time you have a a culture culturally different view in the U.S. in in Silicon Valley, but but also the rest of the U.S. where you know failure is just um, factored in as part of the process and it's okay. And AI is failing a lot. You said it's a research, <laughs> so AI is failing way more often. A lot, yeah. And, and, and exactly. And then on the other hand, you have China, which has a very different view, view on, on this. And, and um, I think it's, it's very interesting to see how they perceive AI as their own, like, almost personal moonshot, a bit like, you know, John F. Kennedy has defined in the 60s or in the 50s already, okay, let's go to the moon. This is going to be our first and foremost national priority, and we're going to do everything it takes. Um, it's the same right now, which China has articulated on, on AI. I don't think there is any other technology that is as highly ranked in terms of importance by the Chinese uh, government and, 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 and 30 billion investments 130 yes. billion investments into this i i, I agree uh read um, global superpowers by kai fu lee or some blog articles about this ai is going full into it and i think i will have a whole series just about chinese ai because they doing a lot of things right okay so you said politics is regulating instead of enabling you said, I think a little bit like society mindset, you know, we have to have it first before we control it. And then you said mindset in China, political willpower and United States more liberal. Well, we are just creative. We do something. What else? Like these were three. What could change? Like politics won't change that easy. Um, mindset in Europe won't change that easy. I think, yeah, we, I need think to, I we need to work on role models. Right. Role we need to work on role models, on lighthouse, lighthouse cases that really work well and can be used as an example how to do it and can be used to, you know, reduce the reduce the perceived risks of doing new things. So, dear audience out there, that's why we do it. Here you have two role models, two people you can identify with and aspire to be similar and they will keep doing the things good because we need role models and honestly, Compared for European AI companies, Mirantix is under the top 10, according to some other sources like Forbes and Handelsblatt, etc. So you're doing something right. So we need more like this. Yeah, I, think one, <laughs> I think, yeah, one thing is like we need, people need just to get started. I think it's we don't have a lack of uh, very well qualified people in Europe in, in the space of AI. There are a lot of, you know, greatly qualified people, but we still have much fewer entrepreneurs. So a lot of um, the people then go in more cushy jobs. And I think so encouraging more people right out of university, but also right out of professional jobs they have been for many, in for many years and encouraging them to actually start companies, I think is super important because that will also just create generally more buzz. And if, if we would, I don't know, quadruple the number of companies you would build per year in, in AI in Germany, not all of them will work mm -hmm. out, but statistically speaking, it will have, it will, it will have a, a positive impact. And then I think the second thing is we need to attract um, more later stage venture capital. It's it's very easy these days, or not easy, but it's there's a lot of investors out there who do like angel and seed investments in AI, but also in other areas. But especially when it comes to like more growth stage investments, so series A, B, C, when it's about five, 10, 20, 50 million of investment. Um, we have those investors in Europe, but they tend to focus more on um, less deep tech related topics and so there are very few investors in europe who really invest in those topics and i think we need we need to draw more capital in there obviously it's great if the government invests there more but also we need to create incentives for 
large pension funds, um, like it, what happens in the US to invest in these models. We need to draw more capital from outside of Europe um, to because I, I, otherwise the communists hit a ceiling at some point and then um, there will be a competitor in the US or China who gets like five or ten times as much funding and as these companies are anyways all globally operating, um, we will we'll, we'll lose the race. And then I think also that should that should be also the paradigm to to think about regulations. Like we need to build the category leaders of tomorrow in Europe because only then we will also be in, able to actually uh, build them after our value systems and also regulate them. Because right now what we're trying with Facebook and Google and regulating them in Europe, it's, it's really hard when they're built in a different geography with like a different mindset, but also yes. when their legal entities are somewhere else and um, they're anyway the globally operating company. So I think building more co of these companies in Europe would definitely help um, also ingraining more of our regulatory and uh, mindset here. What you said is interesting that it has nothing to do about AI, but more about entrepreneurship and startups, more funding, more entrepreneurs, less regulation. So the same problem, all most verticals and just with just interesting because both of you did not mention data and that this is a good but regarding time before we i would like to ask some more questions we have here from the audience yes and um this is coming from it's a really good question and it's just cmu he can maybe or he can say what this means how can ai help solve great or the grand challenges we are facing post corona society climate change etc Short answer, please. You know, 30 seconds each. <laughs> Solve the world problem in 30 seconds. Well, I think short answer would be it will probably help us to understand the problems much better because we can look at a lot of data, much more than the human brain can process to understand what would be the right ways to tackle these problems. In, in the sense of what are the root causes uh, for these problems and how to address them. Yeah, maybe okay. maybe maybe for climate change, there is a really good paper by I think Jan LeCun and uh, I don't know if Joshua Benji is also on there, but like basically a lot of the kind of leading AI figures around the world, which wrote this pretty long paper. It's a few dozen pages around tackling climate change with AI. And that paper has I think like 50 different things that could be tackled with AI and also try, trying to rate, okay, does this really work yet? What is it? What What is really the impact? And so I think that is a perfect starting ground to look at this. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was good. Um, shorter question. Why doesn't Merantex have a B2C product? Well, that's a great question. I think um, it's not. it's not that we have you know, deliberately decided against B2C space. Um, it's just that we have so far not found an interesting model we would want to invest in um, in the in the B2C uh, space. Um, and maybe part of that is that um, building a successful uh, B2C company is usually much less about um, technology than it is about doing good marketing um and so and this is timing and execution <clears throat> yes and timing and execution so um i think again i i i could well imagine ourselves going into into a, a b2c case um if you find one um but also it's it's really fair to say that such a case usually needs very different things than um, the, you know, the perks and uh, expertise we um, have and can provide. Okay. From my view, it's by the way, the B2C gains is gone because Amazon, Google, Facebook, they already own all the end users and the attention. And it's almost impossible to take away their market share to get their attention versus just building on top and then you don't have a billion dollar company. So I agree, it's it's not easy, but the whole B2B business, I mean, we speak about the whole industry, they are not tackled there. And here you're competing with Google and others from zero. So the B2B market for AI is way larger and more open. Um, a quick question for you from Rasmus, from Robin. He asks, which cloud environment for AI development would you recommend for early stage ventures? 
Yeah, I think we, we've been working with all the large cloud providers, so uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, um, and also Telecom. Um, I think they are, they are all fine. I think you need to, I think we, we decided deliberately on against on-premise solution just because you figured, yeah, if you're just a few people, it's fine to build by your own GPUs and everything on site. But once you scale and have a ton of people accessing the data and the data needs to be safe and there's a lot of resources you need, a cloud environment is just more flexible. So that's what we decided on day one. Um, but in the end, also most of our code runs on, on various of these environments. Um, you sometimes need to look... For some industries, if you if you if you're using if you're if you have various industries which are very sensitive around their data, um, not for legal reasons, but more from a perception perspective, it, it helps to go with the European cloud provider or um, like you know, some solution which is maybe even hosted in Germany because like we've, we've seen that sometimes in, in sales processes it makes it a bit easier. But if you're if you're in a less critical area, I mean, any of these work, and you can choose whatever is best for from from a technological okay. perspective. One of the very most difficult questions, but I give you again 30 seconds max to answer. Because um, Hassan says some call it data mining, some call it deep learning, some call it machine learning. What do you really mean what AI is? Let's say, host, what is your definition of AI today? This is always the hardest question. Um, I know. Yeah. I know, but, honestly, okay. there's also a very vague de definition internally. I mean, it's just about creating a machine that makes intelligent decisions. And so if you would show that okay. um, to your, your customers and they would be like, hey, this this machine is smart, or this is, is surprised by their decision making, then I think you could probably call it AI. But like on a more like technical level, um, I mean, we do a lot of deep learning on computer vision. We do a lot of uh, deep learning also for language understanding. Um, we would call those AI probably, the, I mean, the more technical term and also how we mostly call it internally is machine learning or deep machine learning. Um, to the outside, I think to customers, it's just sometimes easier to talk about it as AI and not right. talk about it as deep learning. Um, so that's why also we, we make it a bit simpler for ourselves, but internally we try to use the more precise price terms for this as well. Adrian, what is AI? Well, you could you could go back to the Turing, uh, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's probably it's probably AI uh, once you don't uh, realize it anymore. Interesting. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think we we mostly use machine learning because that's very there's much more clear definition on that yeah you train a machine to recognize patterns in a large set of data and then come up with decision making process um, that is based on this data and and therefore then can act autonomously um, without uh, intervention um, and it's either supervised or unsupervised in the training but in the end it, it takes decisions um, and the the broader, the more complex those decisions get become, the more it goes towards AI, like real intelligence, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's if it's just simple um, decision making in a very narrow field, uh, we wouldn't call it AI. We would call it simple machine learning. AI. To us and and also me, AI is really more towards you know. Uh, a more holistic form of intelligence that can also um, make decisions in new spaces where it hasn't seen a lot of training data and thus um, uh, uh, makes decisions. Okay, last question. And uh, I ask you after our conversation, maybe to stay one, two minutes in the chat. If there are more questions, you can also see the polls there. Sure, um, yeah. maybe hang around so last questions there from the audience is from david Schirm. he's asking out of your mind top of your mind what is currently the strongest nlp company out there well what is in in technical or, or business terms what do you think so it's google it's facebook for me but it's maybe something like digital genius if it's pure ai driven what comes in your mind? I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's it's a large company, surely. Like so, like a Google, like a Facebook, also also like a Microsoft. I think one company which is very strong and in Germany is Deepel. Um, 
So in the in the language yeah, translation yeah. space, I mean they're also consistently beating um, the Google Translate and are doing a great job. Um, so I would say within within Germany, I would say they're yeah the number one. And they also it's not just a company that is great at technology, but also they have a, a business around it, right? And a lot, ton of users. So I think it's a great example and um, something we can be very proud of. Okay. Um, before we finish, um, where do you see Merantix in 10 years? Just dream it for a second. Be bold, be visionary, don't be German. <laughs> yeah, so I think our vision is, is, is to build um, more than 50 companies in the next uh, 10 years. Okay, 50 companies, okay. Or more. Mm -hmm. 50 AI-driven companies or what we call AI later here. Rasmus, more operational. Yeah, I think, I think from another perspective, like in, if in 10 years uh, we look at what are kind of the the, the dominant companies uh, in the globally uh, with AI, that hopefully we have, have built at least one or hopefully several of them. So mm -hmm. uh, we actually have impact. So, so uh, Charles Eudard Bouillet, the former CEO of Wallenberger, said the next trillion dollar company will be an AI company. And he is expecting that like hardware, like software, like AI, it will be tripling each time, it will be huger and bigger. And I hope that from these 50, maybe a handful of German unicorns will come from the Merantix Venture Studio. I, I, For myself, because I've invested in you guys, uh, for me as someone living in Berlin, someone living in Europe, we need more of this. Therefore, thank you for joining today. Thank you for sharing a lot, you know, your knowledge with the live audience, with the playback audience with the podcast audience everyone who will listen to this um you will stay a couple of minutes in the chat there are one two more questions you you find them and you can answer them directly if you want to and within this i say thank you for joining today thanks a lot fabian it was a pleasure and thanks thank for listening everyone thanks. else can stay online um um for uh, my closing words and saying goodbye to everyone um, next week, we do not have a virtual chat because it was planned that we have the Rise of AI conference next week. See, I didn't anticipate this, that we have to cancel it when we planned everything. So next week is a break. Um, but the week after, um, we have a talk with Daniel Jeffries. Keep in mind, it's a new date. It's a Friday, 22nd, I think, 22nd of May. It's a Friday. And maybe someone can link the, uh, post the link here. And we will talk about the post-corona world. We will talk what impact corona has on society, on business, on technology. Daniel Jeffers is a futurist. He's a thinker. He's an author. He's amazingly on Twitter and on Facebook, like huge crowd follower. He's a nerd. He's a hacker. He's a programmer. And he, we both love to discuss for hours what if, how will the world be. So this will be a very interesting dialogue, how the world changes under corona. And else, I already have the new speakers for the next four weeks for you. You will be the first one today to hear what we have. So next one being as a guest after Dan will be Chris Bos, who is the founder of Arago and the CEO. He is advisor to Angela Merkel, the German chancellor for AI. He is in many boards and committees. He's involved because he has expertise. He's really good at transporting knowledge. This will be a very interesting talk and we speak about optimism like we got the question today how can ai solve the big problems and then a week after and you can sign up already all the time for them now um, um we have robin hansen and robin hansen he's a professor at the oxford university for humanity where our where we also have um the institute from nick bostrom who wrote the book super intelligence and um Robin he is author of the book of Emulated Minds, When Robots Rule the World. So if, if you have seen the series upload on Amazon, for example, or have seen a couple of Miran, um, um, Black Mirror episodes, he wrote a book about this. How will the world look like if we upload, con not conscience, but just our skills, our intelligence, and we have robots, or I call them bots, who start working for us, but they increase. You know, like instead of building an AI, you build a human, just artificial other way around. I like the idea. So we will discuss about the implications if you have a whole virtual workforce doing a lot of stuff. And then the last one I like to announce is Thomas Heilmann. 
who's a member of the German parliament. And he will publish just a couple of days before our talk a book, How to Restart Germany. Uh, it's called Neustart Deutschland. So it's a German play. Um, he has written a very good book with 15 other members of the parliament, what governments can do to make this a better place. Like Rasmus and Adrian already um, mentioned, less regulation, less bureaucracy, more funding. They wrote a book about this. I already have read the book. It is the first time that I get like 100 thesis action items, what politicians could do, what administration could do to make this world better. So politics, recommending for the politics, how we can use AI, how we can use blockchain to make this world a little bit more seamless, comfortable and successful and how we find a European way in this. So you were the first one to learn, to know about this. You can sign up online for them. As usual, it was a pleasure to have you here today. I'm looking forward to have you there again in two weeks. Stay healthy, stay at home, and, well, we talk again.